You're listening to a Time Machine podcast. Old movie Time Machine. An adventure through time and or space. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Old Movie Time Machine. This is the show in which we watch color films made in the old U.S. of A. between the years of 1945 and 1965, and we use them as windows into the past. We climb through the window, we poke around, we examine, we probe, we ask a lot of critical questions, such as these people we are observing in this time and in this space. Who are these people? What are their habits? How are they treating one another? What decisions are they making? And why? And also, ultimately, the most important question of all, what are they wearing? And what do their living rooms look like? And at the end of the show, we're going to gather up all of the data. We're going to collate it. We're going to examine it. We're going to extract a lot of uh, hypotheses from it. We will be presenting to you a thesis about this time and this place in this film, in the world beyond the window. And we're going to ask the final, vital, ultimate question on behalf of all of humanity here in the 21st century, which is, you guys, this movie that we just watched, we keep watching this thing? Are we going to keep uh, showing this to other people and talking about this and then spending more of our precious time whiling it away, watching this movie yet again, just because it's there? Or do we just leave it there and then progress beyond, beyond the beyond? Catherine, that expression you just gave me suggests that perhaps you would like to progress beyond today's film, The Ghost of Mr. Chicken. I'm your host, by the way, through time and or space, Justin Zeppa, joined as ever by my incredible panel of international experts at being humans in the 21st century. Starting on my left, as almost always, you know her, you love her, Catherine Sherlock. Welcome back to the program. Hello. Thank you for having me. Lovely to have you with us. And next to you, across the ocean, my sister and yours, Carolyn Narrows. Hey, sis. Hey there. Welcome back to the program. Always a pleasure. Uh, Still recuperating from a very intense Three weeks of Hitchcocktober, of course, very dramatic, very suspenseful, very thrilling. And now I'd like to wish each of you a very happy Halloween, you guys. It's Halloween week. It's it's the time. It's uh, what the kids are calling hashtag spooky season. And we are here and we are going to be presenting to you our version of a spooky season with today's motion picture extravaganza. I'm breaking the rules a little bit because this film came out in 1966. And as I just explained to you all, our window of time that we explore is 45 to 65. But give me a fucking break. You know what I'm talking about? So I have to imagine that, again, no research on this program. I have to imagine this was maybe filmed in 1965. I think that counts, right? I mean, this is not too far removed from other motion pictures we have watched from this part of the spectrum, right? It's seems older. It seems older. That's kind of what I'm looking for. Sure. Um, <laughs> wow. We're talking Ghost and Mr. Chicken today, you guys. 1966, starring Mr. Don, Donny Boy, Knotts. And I have to tell you, we're going to I mean, explain this to you right up front. This is not your average episode. This is basically a Jay-Z's pick, because as my table is aware, uh, I cannot analyze this movie in any kind of objective fashion. It is formative to me as a person. It is a a highlight reel of firsts as I watch it now. Uh, First feelings, first learning about concepts like pain, like what happens when one slams their hand in a car door or gets hit over the head by a two by four. Like this is real pain. This leads to shouting by people. So must avoid this. Uh, the the concept of suicide. Uh, this is where I learned what suicide is. It's it's very cleanly stated, laid out in this film. It haunted me like nothing else after watching this. When I must have been, I'm putting it around four, five years old tops, and I definitely could not sleep after watching this movie. 
And Carolyn, dad had to come into my little bedroom in the Fowlerville farmhouse and explain to me that our bedroom because we shared a bedroom. Yeah. And I'll tell you, Carolyn, this goes back so far. I don't even remember you being there. I don't I don't know where you were. So, I mean, you could have been probably you were probably in the crib or something probably under the age of one. Yeah. I mean, you were not involved in this process at all. I mean, the time, the way the timeline goes, like, there's no way I would be remembering this any younger than four, right? I mean, it's got to be in there somewhere. Right. But you're like two and a half years old. Right. So I would have been somewhere between like zero and one. Yeah. Yeah. And had you watched this movie, it would have scared the shit out of you too. Well, I also grew up in it because we watched it all yes. the time. But for some reason, I never found it. As scary as Michael Jackson's thriller. Mm, well, he does turn into that terrible zombie man. Yeah. And so. that's why mom and dad, when I was about four or five, made me watch the making of thriller VHS yes, that we could get from like course. Marshall's movie world that explained the whole process of how mm-hmm. he came into the cat thing so that yes, yes. I could understand the magic of. Okay. So you yeah. have your own damages that you, that you carry with you, you, your own scars from. I am hardly the only person damaged by Michael Jackson. Well, I'm like yes. so we can- low on that totem pole. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, then, um, listen, madam, you have closed down the Michael Jackson talk in previous episodes. I just want to point that out. So but a point, your point is well taken. So uh, all I'm saying is that this is, this is nothing but fun for me because this movie has followed me around. I have, I have followed this movie around over the years ever since then. It's been a staple. I've shown it to many people. You are not the first. And... To, to, I might have been the first. To mixed results. <laughs> um, I think I was the first person. Well, most likely, yes. You could have a tape and you could set it on a super long extended play and record like four movies on there. And this was one of those tapes that had Ghost of Mr. Chicken on it. And uh, it was Be just... kind and please rewind. Well, I yeah. Know that makes no sense to this generation, but... It was imperative at the time, though. Because who's got the yeah. time to wait for that tape to rewind? And I just want you to know up front that I have been the thing that I'm going to choose mm-hmm. for the boomer. Oh, okay, wow, is something that I have been like dreaming about taking. Okay, from my earliest childhood. Wow. Memories. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> so it's a real. It's a personal journey. <laughs> Today's it's episode. Really a personal journey. Okay. For many of us. Does this mean I, I have to be gentle? Please show yourself out, Catherine. Oh, God, Actually, no. no. You should not be gentle because it's <laughs> also one where I'm like, this movie sucks. Well, okay, <laughs> okay, okay. It. So, uh-huh. and this is where I am curious where the conversation goes today. I am just pure curiosity because, Catherine, as I was explaining to you earlier today, I am not changing my opinion on this movie and what I cannot. It's It's impossible because it is so formative. I am incapable of changing my perspective because it is among the deepest of furrows in my mind. We're going down a deep rabbit hole today. Yeah, I mean, it's just one, <laughs> like, it goes back to the very beginning. You know, it's a, it's an origin story of sorts, the ghost of Mr. Chicken. Yeah, I mean, I have no intention of uh, trying to change that experience right, you can't. You, you no, could I, battle I it if you tried, right. No, yeah. no, 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 no. But this was my first experience. I know, it. and I'm so excited to right. find out. So, <laughs> should we kick off the proceedings here? Yes. Let's do our one-line reviews. We Catherine should. Sherlock, do you have one for the ghost and Mr. Chicken? And if so, what the hell is it? <laughs> yes. This will be the most accurate one-line <laughs> yeah. Right, right. Oof, right. I'm not sure I'll be able to get through this with a straight face, but here we are. Okay. Okay, nightly emissions of massive organ music send small community into a panic where a reluctant hero Scooby Doo's the culprit and gets the girl. You're totally right. It is a Scooby Doo episode, 100%. We just needed a dog, a great Dane. Yeah, yeah. It really it is of the same era as Scooby Doo. Uh, it also reminded me of. Speaking of Hitchcock Tober and everything, but and I've mentioned this in the past, but Alfred Hitchcock branded himself onto a series of books called The Three Investigators, where three boys have a private detective agency and they end up do it, solving a lot of haunted house type, uh, ghosty murder type plots and schemes. It's all so it's like 1960s pulp fiction for boys basically so it's like the hardy boys but the 1960s version uh yeah right right and more more spooks a little, a little creepier than the hardys i would say 
and this is just a summation of that aesthetic as well so but it, you're, it's total scooby-doo don Knotts is a cartoon character thank you so much carolyn do you have a one-line review for the ghost of mr chicken i do okay you ready for it would you please share your one-line review for the ghost of mr chicken attaboy loser <laughs> yeah there it is <laughs> <laughs> yep. that's all i can say about this movie right out of the gate we are opening with a universal picture it is an edward mole in charge of production so you know it's quality we've seen that name before but it's because of this movie you guys that i think this is my favorite opening uh logo for for motion picture studio this this exact one this is it this is the one with the three-dimensional golden letters and the different rings around the earth and the glorious, glorious widescreen. I mean, this is everything to me with the mysterious music uh, scored by Vic Mizzy, of course. Spooky caper music. <laughs> Perfectly put. <laughs> it is it is great. Like, I was listening to it. I had a really nice time watching this movie, you guys, uh, recently. And this is the first time this year maybe in a couple of years actually of watching this. And I was just loving every frame of just like, I love every part of this, that music comes on. And I remember being a kid and just thinking like, that's a hot riff. Like, this is good. <laughs> this is good stuff. Dun, 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 dun. Like that's good. Catherine, you're shaking your head. No. I think that's also why you like the monsters. Yeah, yes. It's, exactly. it's almost identical. Yeah. Exactly. It's almost identical. Did Vic Mizzy and do the monster theme? I have no or was idea. This a Bob Mosher? We're not. Hold on. I have no idea. Because if but he did both. my whole point is that there's me. like that whole spooky vibe. Like, is this house the monster's house too on the back lot? I have no idea. Carol, I'm glad you asked. I do have information on that because. Oh, do you? Yes. Because the monster house, which we all know, Catherine, is located at 1313 Mockingbird Lane and is also located on, I think it's called Colonial Street. On the Universal back lot, if I'm not mistaken, I've never been there, but I we gotta go. It, it then later became the basis for uh, what was that show called, The Housewives Show? Uh, Desperate Housewives. Desperate Housewives. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I've seen it. Right. So all of these houses, I mean, these these would probably be the same houses we saw in the long, long trailer, if I'm not mistaken. I, oh, that might have been a Paramount, though. Uh, anyway, they're all back lot. So the Munster House, though, is, is next to the Simmons Mansion on, okay. in, on the back lot. So we don't see it in this film, but apparently in Munster Go Home, we do see the Simmons Mansion. And Munster Go Home, I think, was the same year as this, maybe? That might be next year's. That's another formative. This corner <laughs> of the back lot of Universal is very important to me as a human being. <laughs> I got to go there. Um, I'm just going to say that Monster Go Home, I think, is one that I'm going to also have to include in my seminal films. Absolutely. Ghost of Mr. Chicken, like, not so probably much. in my top 15. No, oh, okay. it's got to be in my top 15. Okay. But, like, yeah, Monster Go Home is, I cannot wait. Now, there's something that I've not been able to locate for as vast as the internet is. And we know that a lot of information is on the internet, right? There is something missing. And that is an image of the VHS version of this intro to this film. Because back in the day, in the early 1980s, we're seeing this in a, a like I said, glorious widescreen, right? Which in the old days of televisions, of course, Catherine, you may recall, they were square, right? Mm -hmm. So you had to do a thing called pan and scan. So you're zooming in on the image. And if something happens on the far side of it, you have to hold where you are in the film and scan over to show the character on that side because you look lost. Have yeah. I lost you? Yeah. Okay. I don't remember. That. Okay. Okay. I don't remember interacting in any way. Well, you didn't have no, to do you anything. You didn't have to do anything. Oh. So, but, but when they <laughs> took it to the square, they would basically um, be like, oh yeah, so this character over here is talking uh, to this one over okay. here. So we're going to um, frame it here and then- Keep showing this frame and mm. slide it over. And I see. Now, gotcha. another thing they did, because sometimes in these motion pictures, such as the case here with the Universal logo, which we see takes up all of the widescreen, mm. as does the following, I believe, the following title. Yes, the Ghost of Mr. Chicken here takes up widescreen. Therefore, we cannot crop it, right? We have to see the whole thing, which means we have to have the bars, the letterboxing mm -hmm. at the top and bottom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But back in the day, 
an old VHS, that letterboxing wasn't black. It had like a pattern, like a kind of curly Q, weird wrought iron type of pattern that Ooh. is really, again, because this is so formative, creeped me out. <laughs> There's something about, and in my memory, I'm going to draw this for Catherine so she can see, it's something, something like this, these sort of curly right. Q uh, lines mm. kind of looks like an old fence, right? I, I don't, sure. that's, and and it was eerie to me. I don't know why. But everything about this movie is eerie to me, Catherine. This font, or the two fonts here, three fonts, this font here is normal. This is a scary font, and the Mr. Chicken is also a scary font. It's 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 wobbly, it you know, weird. it's warped, right? Yes. And then Ghost is also in a weird uh, sort of stabby type of, I don't know, it's it's heavy on the top, kind of pointing at the bottom kind of thing. But even the font freaked me out at mm. the time. We're in for a freaky time. And also just the word ghost is in the title. So obviously they're just putting it out there like prepare for ghouls, goblins, ghosts. Mm -hmm. The goblins is a push actually. That's me reading between the lines. They're promising ghosts and chickens. Hmm. Um, I don't remember seeing it. <laughs> there is chicken in this is. picture in a soup form. Mm, this is true. Let's get back to the film. I'm sorry. <laughs> so opening credits, we have this amazing Vic Mizzy score. Maybe I'll drop some in in the background here and uh, we can rock out to it a little bit. It's just the, the folks at home listening to it. Do you hear that? Yeah, that's a good time. And then it switches from a very propulsive monster-like theme to something... That's more, it's more Mr. Chickeny theme, which is the boom, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, which is just the sound of Don not doing anything. That's, that's the music yeah. that themes his behavior. And my note here is already a bit annoyed. Okay. <laughs> Correction. Like very annoyed. Okay. <laughs> because of that, that music cue yeah. in particular. Okay. Yeah. Now, I also have questions about this opening scene that I've never thought about before. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, so do you want me to describe it real quick and then we will get yeah. to your questions? Okay. So we're watching, we open with our protagonist, Luther Heggs played by Don Knotts uh, recently departed from the Andy Griffith show at this point. And he is driving his Edsel down this down the Universal back lot, and as he does so, he passes a large drunk man named Calver Weems, who is singing himself a little song while thunder and lightning crashes all around them. And as he walks down the street, from behind a large bush emerges a two by four, which then clonks down on his head and brings it fells him. It brings him to the ground like so many chopped trees. And who should see this but a woman across the way whose name is Susanna Blush. And she, for whatever reason, is she's in her house robe and she's got her curlers happening and she's all prepared for bed. She's just about to sit down and watch Lawrence Welk, as is her want. And she sees the murder of Calver Weems by two by four. And she starts screaming in a way that is bone chilling to this day. Is it? It. Susanna Blush's screams, they are piercing. I mean, they're, okay, they're, they're piercing. Piercing is one thing, but they are also blood curdling. I believe this. Carolyn, how do you feel about the screams of Susanna Blush? Oh, I think she's like the town gossip slash town crier. She's <laughs> like, she's just jumping to conclusions here. Absolutely. Well, of, yeah. of course she is. But those screams are real, though. In your childhood version, yes. You're In my mind, I know. Again, I, th I think this is the... I, I also have... My, my comments about this opening scene was just continual shouting and screaming. <laughs> Why? It's supposed I'm, to be funny, though. I'm so glad was you it? brought it up. Okay, so here's Just the thing. Like, I was I couldn't stand it. <laughs> I was going to wait until we got to the police station, but we'll talk about it now since you've already brought it up. But <laughs> this is a very common thread. Whenever I show this picture to people, they're like, this is the loudest movie I've ever heard. It is just people <laughs> shouting. <Yes, sir. laughs> it's just people shouting for the first 10 minutes Yeah, at each other. It's so loud. So I totally understand. It tones it down very eventually. American. Well, I was saying that the, it's for you, it's scary. For me, it's fun and funny. Mm -hmm. It's obviously, this is billed as a comedy. 
I understand it's not funny. I do. I do get that. I think there are a couple of funny bits in here yeah. that I will stand behind. I, mm, the, yeah, I mean, I was my one line review was inspired by some uh, what I interpreted as inappropriate ish. Okay, there was definitely a little d- double entendre ish. I mean, whether it was genuinely intentional, I don't know because language was different then. Yes, I mean the word. Spunk, spunk was yeah. thrown around, and the line, "Oh, I get that from my mother." Yeah, she was. She had plenty of spunk. <laughs> I was like, "Okay." That will be a drop, of course. We'll, we'll put that in she right here. Plenty of spunk. Yeah, there it is. There it is. He said it. I mean, I, I, I heard it too. Watching and also <laughs> the massive organ. I was like, <laughs> "This is a gift." Now I have to work that into my one line review. <laughs> it's the only way. <laughs> Spunk and massive organs. Oh, what's not to love, right? And, and, and there was like the- Nightly emissions. The, I think I just added that, but- Because um, yeah, it would no, just, it had to be, I couldn't have massive organ without nightly sure. emissions. It just had to, <laughs> had to go together. Like, I appreciate it. Um, I definitely heard Mrs. Simmons as Mrs. Seaman at some point. Really? Yes. Oh, I never and I was like- Plenty of spunk. Uh, what? <laughs> what? What's the undercurrent so here? Am I? Is this like just one of these children's things where there's lots of adult humor in it? That, it, that very well could be. It, it could be. Yeah. I mean, this is all. I mean, a b- bunch of fucking middle-aged men wrote this movie. Yeah, I, it, it's an easy leap. Yeah, to make. it's a bit like I, I was it Captain Pugwash and Seaman Stains. <laughs> um, is that a thing? That's a thing. What is? What is it called again? I'm sorry. Cap- Captain Pugwash. <laughs> and Seaman Stains? He was, he was oh, so obviously he's a one of the- Yeah, he was one of the pirates or something. Oh yeah. it's, so- a bl- it's a black and white um, animated British thing. Please look it up. It's hilarious. Seaman and Stains. And Seaman Stains. <laughs> <laughs> that seems purposeful. See, honestly, honestly, I don't want to jump to this, this ha- That <laughs> has formed my humor um, palette. <laughs> so there we are. <laughs> I apologize not. So uh, so you you love Luther's mom full of spunk. She mm. had plenty of spunk. That's your I thing. love the line. So Susanna Blush sees this this happen and Luther as he's driving, I mean you can't avoid the screams of Susanna Blush, so he hears them. He whips his Edsel around and he goes back to the oh, scene you of the mean crime. He makes a three-point turn. Yes, yes, he does. Yeah, well, there's no whipping around in that car. There is like a no, and, and there's a knocking down of basically anything in the way on the pavement. The trash cans. Yeah. By the way, we're in Rachel, Kansas, and we get the Chamber of Commerce sign. You know, the "Welcome to Rachel" thing. I just wanted to look at this. We got a Kiwanis. We got a Rotary Club. Friday noon. It gives you the times. The Welcome Optimist, Optimist Club. Club. The Lions. Oh, Rachel, yeah. Kansas. Population six thousand three hundred eighty-four. Elevation seven hundred twenty feet. Just a little bit of trivia for you diehards out there. Are there any diehards out there? Please write us party line at oldmovietimemachine.com. dot com. Did this movie scare you too? Please reaffirm <laughs> my everything. <laughs> Right. Our number one fan, David, definitely was like, I have watched this movie He had before. seen it. Our old David Time Machine had, had watched. Old David <laughs> Time Machine 100% was like, I think I grew up in this movie. I was like, I bet you did. It's from like before you were born. Old David Time Machine. <laughs> and this is why, I mean, you know, some of us are just old, old people, even in no, our youth. he's even older. But uh, he's- I would like to ask at least you, Catherine, I think mm. is the most objective observer here. The the newest person to jump into this lake of the ghost of Mr. Chicken, if you will. Who is Luther Heggs? Who is this man? Like, how? where does he come from? How does he get to be the cowardly character that we see him here? And Carolyn, please, you feel free if you have any theories on this. Because we know he's... First, he's but I, I have some ideas. He's local, right? Because we we meet his school teacher later, and she's a part of the community. We meet her at the trial. So he grew up here. Doesn't seem to have any family, though. Uh, He is of... How old do you think he is? It's really hard to say, right? I mean, he's not... Yeah, he seems older than the bully, but perhaps he isn't. Maybe they're the same age. Yeah, could be. I mean, he's... Don Knotts is a... Has an interesting face to be to put it. Maybe generously. they're both thirty five, and one of them is just super unattractive. Yeah, I mean, he is a noodle, and he does. He was known for his kind of buggy eyes, 
and very expressive, cartoony face. Mm. So, okay, let's put him in, yeah, mid to late 30s, maybe. I mean, and also this is a... Knotts was actually born. Yeah, I mean, yeah, sure, sure, why not? I'm just curious. How old he's supposed to be and how old he actually is are two very different things in Hollywood. Exactly, yeah, yeah, but I'm still curious. Let's, Let's find out. But, Catherine, what do you think... He was born in 1924. 1924. This is 66. So he's, what is that, 42? Am I doing math? He's 42. 42. Okay. I did math. Look at that, you guys. On the fly. Numbers. I'm known I for my did numbers. It on my phone. I am not known for my numbers, and I did it on my phone. <laughs> well, that was wise. We. I'm not known for numbers, so that was wise. So he's 42. Interesting. What do you think, Catherine? What's your theory? What's his story? Uh, I have none. Okay. <laughs> it didn't occur to me in any way, shape, or form. Alrighty. I mean, I you want to hear my story? I just assumed small town, not necessarily left that town. Don't know. Yes, he's certainly a small town mind, uh, but he also has aspirations too. He's a dreamer. He's a fantasist. Mm. He. I think he's the town idiot. I mean, like one hundred percent. But but he's not idiot. an idiot though, you know. He's no, I know he's not, but that's the role he's been painted. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, the he town just, sees him he that just way. thinks differently, and I mean that that comes out in the in the trial later, and like um, the people who kind of stand for him, who actually end up kind of condemning him more, mm-hmm. um, because he just he he does see the world a bit differently. Yeah, and he's he, he also he, yeah he's not he's not conformist, right? And I think he's taking strides. We learned that he's you know he. He's done his mail order karate lessons, and he's done mail order journalism. Uh, he has a certificate from some subscription, uh, you know, mail away, learn how to be a reporter type of thing he mentions later. So he's trying to do things for himself, and yet here he is. He's 42. He's living in a rented room at a boarding house in the town that he has never left. And So I, my backstory for this character, I could be totally wrong, mm-hmm. but I think that he and Ollie and Alma, mm-hmm. we were about to meet Alma, mm-hmm. all went to high school together. Maybe not the exact same grade, but in and around the same mm-hmm. span of time. Okay. And I feel like maybe uh, Luther was an only child of maybe older parents, mm-hmm. and that's why he's weird. Yeah, okay. And so they would have, they would have passed away when he was still a relatively young to middle-aged man. So, like, let's say he's not playing 42, but he's supposed to be 35. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and therefore, he may live at the boarding house more because he does not have any more family left. Right. Still wants to be social, also not ready to own his own home. Yeah, he's just a typesetter, so he's not making a lot of money. And also, he seems right. to be embraced by... Or at least there's a mutual understanding with the old this older generation we're seeing here. Oh, mm. He seems way more connected to them, or they seem to be looking out for him more than he does with his contemporaries who, again, this is 1966, like the 60s are underway, and yet he seems to be from a previous generation, you mm. know. Which is why I'm wondering if he's like an only child yeah. from an older couple, much like Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Mm, Okay. Well, not his mother was like, his dad was like 53 when he was born. His mother was like 25. Mm, Okay. But like only child there, you know, I mean, just interesting, like where he seems to come from a previous generation. I agree with that. So that's where I'm kind of like, he's not hip. He's not cool. Yeah. But I could totally see an only child of of an older couple actually connecting more with an older generation than the younger generation. It's that doesn't mean he doesn't have dreams, doesn't want to improve himself, right. you know. It's kind of sad. It's making me feel even more for this character that I already Sorry. love so much. <laughs> no, it's great. I love it. I, we're just bringing new depth to what is a, a deep text. But what about the, um, the smarmy, good-looking bully? He's uh, in yeah. the same position. But uh, he, was the, he was the quarterback. And was, and how? But how is he? In he's in the same boat. I mean, if you if you if you're feeling sorry think, for the one, then he's hipper though. He's parents, clearly hipper. He's clearly I think his hipper. His parents but, are still alive, but he wanted to have independence, and maybe he is someone who went away to college and got a journalism degree, and he's back in the hometown. Wants to sweep Alma off her feet Mm. because he's big man on campus. Mm -hmm. See, uh, my theory is, uh, and that could totally be the case. 
Uh, my theory is and that making it up. either Ali or Alma were not locals and they moved to the town for some reason. And, you know, so I could see that with, with Ali maybe of like, okay, I got this yeah, gig. I'm a reporter. Yeah. Maybe I come from a slightly larger town or just a different area or whatever. But maybe I, he comes from, from like Kansas, Kansas city. Mm-hmm, right. Right. And so I got this I'm, gig. I'm, I'm a writer. I'm my miles. Yeah, I get I'm getting reporter, building up my right, bylines, right, right. my portfolio and everything. And so I've come here. I'm hanging out with Mr. Beckett. We're we're bros. We're we're chilling. And so while I'm getting my life together here at Exciting Rachel, Kansas, I'm going to stay at the boarding house. And this is where I've run into this weird totally. noodly fish man. Don this is better. I like this version. Oh, okay. So anyway, Luther comes down to have breakfast with everybody. Uh, and we all know how I feel about eating in movies. But these guys are really chowing down. Ollie is taking down They're this toast like, like nobody's business. This is a rough day on the set for Ollie, I imagine, because he's eating toast all morning. He's just chomping away. And it looks delicious. The, uh, Do you think Don Knotts meat needs more than one take? Because I doubt it. No, but I, you know, we're we're doing different setups and everything. There's a lot of coverage that needs to happen. So I bet you he Ollie's eating quite a few pieces of toast. I would bet you. I like toast. Uh, I do too, actually. It'd be mm. nice and lovely. Mm. Lovely toast would be good. Catherine, how you feel about toast? You good? I enjoy toast. Yeah, sure. Uh, a bit of wheat or white? Which way, really? Okay, rye or pumpernickel? <laughs> Not pumpernickel. Really. Okay. So. Lately, we have been toasting Italian bread rubbed with garlic clove. Mm. Oh, in, interesting. In the pan, in olive oil and salt. Cast iron? It could, it could be. Oh, okay. Sure. Also, be, put like a be. tomato on that. If you do like the olive oh. oil and then, and then a tomato like on that as well, just rub it all in. The, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. A bruschetta with it. That sounds lovely. So we're, anyways, we're, so we're getting anyway. toast, right? I mean, great moments in toast uh, in, in the Ghost of Mr. Chicken here. And, of course, the, the old ladies are very sweet to him, but they do kind of tease him. And, you know, hey, Luther, uh, you know, a person's never dead until their pulse is stopped, which I thought was a funny line, Catherine. I think that shit holds up. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, I get it. Is, I get it. And they're teasing is him. Is that how you learned that people were dead? Probably. I, I, this is where I learned of the concept of a pulse, most likely. <laughs> Is from this this little movie. So uh, they do kind of tease the story behind the haunted Simmons mansion here. We just, just a tease, but we get a little bit of, you know, there was a murder there and a suicide. Murder and suicide, Catherine. Mm. <laughs> Folks, if I'm addressing Catherine, it's because I feel like I'm losing Catherine. <laughs> so I just want to bring her back. I, I was never really in the room. I want to share the joy with you, Catherine. The, no. Hey everybody, Midroll Jay-Z here, breaking in per use to let you know about the amazing products that we have going on over at our Tee Public store. The link is in the show notes, as ever. And today we want to put a spotlight on, last week it was of course Boardroom Handies, still available, everybody. We still have stuff in stock right now. Get your Boardroom Handy merchandise. But also today we wanted to point out the new Time Machine Podcast logo merchandise, now available. It's uh, of course, our parent company, Time Machine Podcasts, and you can wear this with pride and with class, and with elegance. It's really kind of a, a black tie, formal type of design, something you could wear to a, an evening gala of some sort. Uh, that's what this is appropriate for. It's classy, people. That's all you need to know is it's pure class. And if you get merchandise with this logo, you're going to be classy, too. And also, you're going to get a big old thank you from me and the team here, just like this. Here, this one's for free. Thank you. And now back to the show. And so we go to the Rachel Courier Express where we see Luther at work as a typesetter. And we see his accomplice, Mr. Kelsey, who seems to be some kind of handyman or custodian, janitor figure. He's always sweeping, Mr. Kelsey, dusting the very dusty offices of the local paper. And they are discussing the previous night's events of Calver Weems and the two by four. And Mr. Kelsey, who is, again, a very, everything this man says is so deeply imprinted onto my brain because the way he says it is very musical in nature. And I believe he's, what's the accent? Irish, probably? Yes, I yeah. think that's the attempt. 
He's going for Iris, yeah. Mm. And so he really lays into the you know, rolling his R's or whatever when he talks about because that's a murder house. You know, it's very that would be Scottish. Oh, oh okay, okay, yes. maybe that's a murder house. Maybe he's a bit softer on the R's then, but it's it, it's very piratey almost. Mm. It's a murder house. If there's something about the way he says it that mm. sticks with me. And so he then starts talking about the old story, not the two by four story, but the old tragedy at the Simmons mansion. They're interrupted at one point. Ollie comes in and gives him a hard time as per usual and asks for a filler piece to just fill out the page of the next edition. And to which Luther replies with uh, some karate chops and the statement, I'll fill him someday. I'll fill him someday. Which... Ooh. Yeah, mm. I mean, could be taken many ways. Yeah, and then we start talking about spunk later as well in mm. the same scene. So, yeah, we get this. Mister Kelsey starts planting this. He's incepting this idea in into Luther's very weak mind, which is, you know what? I'm going to tell you the story of the haunted house in town here. And here it is. So he he weaves the story because he was back in the day, 20 years prior, during the time of the murder-suicide at the Simmons Mansion, he was the gardener. And so he spins the tale very nicely, I think, about how Mrs. Simmons had, you know, uh, was beautiful with black eyes and skin like alabaster and all this. And the old man Simmons was crazy jealous of her and he stabs her in the throat, but we don't know with what. And then he runs up to the organ loft in the mansion, which apparently an organ loft is standard issue. Uh, I was always led to believe through this movie that, mm. oh, if you have a mansion or a largest house, there's a, an upstairs area for the organ, of course, yes, for all the, the pipes. Massive pipe organs. organ. The, <laughs> and it's many musical emissions. And he plays this organ with blood dripping from his hands. And then he jumps up and he throws himself out the window. And this is where a, a, the concept of suicide is explained to a young Jay-Z. Like, oh, kills himself. And that's a suicide. Interesting. Luther is, of course, terrified, as is any four-year-old watching this movie. But maybe not so much Catherine Sherlock. Hmm. And they weave a little plot to, you know, instead of putting in a standard bit of copy here for this three inches of filler we need to make, to finish the paper, why don't you write a little blurb about the 20 year anniversary of the murder suicide at the local murder house? Luther's a little hesitant, but he's like, yeah, maybe I will do that. And he does so by copying exactly what Mr. Kelsey tells him to. And so this makes it into the paper. And becomes quite a sensation throughout town. They decide, because this story has been so popular, guys, we're going to do a follow-up. So what could we do for a classy follow-up for this? Somebody should spend the night in the haunted house. And Ollie, of course, volunteers right away because he's a glory seeker, of course. But Mr. Beckett's like, no, it's, uh, you're too cynical. You're too smart, for God's sake. You're too handsome for this. We got to get some noodly loser who do we know oh luther he's in the basement he's downstairs setting the type and they go down to speak with him and they sell him on this idea of we're going to give you a byline you're going to write this story but to do that you have to go sleep overnight in the haunted house with all the ghosts thus begins the haunted house section of this movie very exciting, very creepy. Uh, my first haunted house, the Simmons Mansion. So Luther stumbles and fumbles his way inside. It's it's a it's one pratfall after another as he falls through the coal chute and he uh, is frightened by his own flashlight and he knocks into an old phonograph that makes loud noises because again this is the loudest movie ever made and. He climbs his way upstairs to the Simmons mansion. And this is just classic haunted house, you guys. Cobwebs everywhere. Shrouds covering mysterious shaped furniture. Old timey wallpapers and uh, carpets and oil portraits of the murdered Mrs. Simmons. There she is. And he sees this painting of her in the front entry. And he's like, Mrs. Simmons. And we know, we know the 
that this is how weighted this is because she was murdered. She was stabbed in the throat, Catherine. Think about that. Stabbed in the throat. That's, yeah. Something. Terrifying. And uh, Luther makes himself a little camp on the sofa in the main sitting room of the Simmons mansion here. And as he does so, he is suddenly surrounded by sounds, mysterious thumpings, and the sound of chains being dragged, and then eventually laughter, maniacal laughter even. And he assumes that it's Ollie, who he ran into outside the house. Ollie skipped over it. But Ollie tried to scare him. Go figure. Because he's a bully. He's an asshole. We hate Ollie. And so he assumes it's Ollie, and he he throws a book in the general direction of where the laughter is coming from, which is a bookcase, which then mysteriously slides open to reveal a secret passageway, a secret staircase. Ooh. And he climbs the staircase, and he finds himself up in that massive organ's loft. And... <laughs> And then eventually finds himself up with the organ itself. And he goes and he looks at it and you can still see the blood on the keys of the organ, which they tried to, they tried to clean it off, Catherine. They even yeah, used Bon Ami. Yeah. Yeah. I and um, didn't, didn't work. work. It's still didn't there. Work. The clock strikes midnight, Catherine. Mm. And what should happen? But the organ begins to play. But there's nobody there, Catherine. It's just the keys moving. This eerie Vic Mizzy theme uh, emitting from the haunted organ played by nobody. It's a ghost, Catherine. Clearly mm-hmm. a ghost. Well, Mr. Chicken is a chicken, of course. So he freaks out of this and runs downstairs, stumbles his way through all the cobwebs, only to turn and find the portrait of Mrs. Simmons stabbed in the throat with a pair of pruning shears, blood pouring gushing from this painting this is a real nightmare for young me for even old I me can see that this yeah. is terrifying this is a terrifying visual hmm. th- th- this scene yeah sure. you can see the blood in motion it's mm. physically dripping down the painting mm. i mean it's awesome but it's also very scary but it's cool it's a cool effect uh, and it affects luther and he passes out. Carolyn, do you have any thoughts on uh, the murder of the Simmons portrait? I mean, I think it's very effective. Mm-hmm. Uh, it certainly scared me as a child, especially with the buildup of the organ playing, the blood yeah. on the keys, and then for him to go back downstairs where he'd already passed the portrait, which was not damaged previously. Right. For it to be. Strange things are afoot. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Shears in the throat. As we hear back at the office of the Rachel Courier Express, but he is relating his story to Ollie and Mr. Beckett, and they are trying to type it together as he's just talking about how he'll never forget about this for as long as he lives and the horrors of the things that he saw. And this becomes, again, a town sensation in Rachel, Kansas. Everybody in town is reading about Luther's experience in the old haunted house And everybody has different takes on this. Some people are skeptical. Some people are terrified on his behalf. Some people, such as Cranky Nick Simmons, just think he's a dick. And this is really foiling all of his schemes to tear down all that old woodwork imported from Europe, (laughs) as previously indicated. (laughs) So... (laughs) But Luther's like, hey, I've got other ammunition. Follow me into the living room. I'm going to show you the sliding door secret panel. And he describes how he picks up a book and he throws it at the bookcase and whoosh, it opens. Except it does not open. And he keeps throwing books at this thing and it does not open. And the judge is like, all right, listen, dude, let's should go up to see the organ, the haunted organ, please. And they go up there and it's almost midnight. So they're just setting everything up to be as appropriate as needed to get the ghost to come play the goddamn organ. I personally love this scene where he goes, whoa, Yeah, yeah. Go. <laughs> Again, the, li- literally the music. The musicality, yes, yeah. The musicality of the performance. Well, go on, play. Like, yeah, yeah. He's like egging it whoa, on with his hands going, like, whoa. Nick Simmons is there and he calls it for what it is, which is ridiculous. And... Everybody just kind of wanders out of the organ loft after the midnight bells chime and no ghost is seen playing that haunted organ, that bloodstained organ. 
and everybody just leaves and they're just like, yeah, okay. And everybody, his, his closest allies abandon him. Mr. Beckett tells him, basically, you're fired and please kindly fuck off. I'm done with you. Even Mrs. Alma has gone in with him what? and Alma's like, the yeah, left downstairs and she's exploring. I okay. was going to get there. I was going to get around. I just she's want, investigating. I wanted to note that Halcyon Maxwell, the leader of the occult society, also hits him with her handbag. Yeah. She's so upset about it. But yes, Alma is the only one who stands by her hags and is down there looking for entry into the secret passageway. Which she finds by moving the andiron at the fireplace, which ends up being a secret trigger nobody knew about until that very moment. But it does make the fire, the uh, bookcase slide to the side, and that is where something crazy happens that we're going to run into in a moment. But first, outside the house, as Luther is about to walk away, completely defeated, his reputation is destroyed. He is forever going to be Mister Chicken and a liar now. In a court of law, guilty of being a liar and of defaming Nick Simmons' character and the family name's character. And he's about to walk off right next to those dirt curbs when all of a sudden we hear organ music playing from the Simmons mansion. Massive organ music. <laughs> it's so big that Nightly organ. Emissions. <laughs> Like, the emissions go all play. over the place, all mm-hmm. over the neighborhood. <laughs> mm-hmm. And he, no, mm-hmm. I was thinking actually when Album was playing with the and irons, mm-hmm. and it was the bookcase that opened. I was like, you know what would be really cool at this point in the movie if the fireplace switched around and it was uh, Doctor Jones and Doctor Jones from the oh, the last tied to the chairs back to back. Yeah, yeah. sure. <laughs> That'd be amusing. Tied back to back in the chairs. Yeah, I was like, that would uh-huh. be cool. Another Scooby Doo ish movie. <laughs> yes. I mean, we're in pure Scooby Doo mode Absolutely. at this point. Like, I'm this sorry. is at this point. Yeah. It's, I'm in Scooby Doo mode. I'm like, what would be funny at this point? That. Yeah, that would be fun. I'm Harrison sure. Ford and Sean Connery in the fire. If Mad Magazine had done a parody of Ghost of Mr. Chicken, they they would that have would included cool. Connery and and Harrison in that scene. Oh, hello. Please continue. Yes. Um, <laughs> cheers. So Luther runs back into the house and he cannot believe his, his lying ears. He is hearing the exact same chilling Vic Mizzy theme of murder and suicide. He goes up to the organ loft yet again. And who should be playing the organ? But Mr. Kelsey, he of the great idea of spending the night in the haunted house, who is also the gardener. Why wasn't this man like suspect number one the entire time? I have no idea. And also small town. Not that again, I can't change my perspective on this movie. It is a perfect film. It is the godfather of Don Knotts movies. But I will say that the plot hole that I discovered upon watching it this last time is regarding the hidden staircase what about the exit? What I mean, he exits into the organ loft. Like, why didn't he just go that way and go back down and show them like, oh, I came out here. We don't see the other exit. It, it's an issue. It's an issue. So when we remake this shortly with Steve Buscemi, we're going to have to fix that. Just so you guys know, like a modern audience will not let this stand. So. <laughs> anyway, it turns out Mr. Kelsey is the one who's been up here teasing everybody with his organ shenanigans the entire time. Mm. I said organ shenanigans. Yes, you what did. do you call it? <laughs> the nightly emissions from the organ shenanigans <laughs> are alive and well all around Rachel, Kansas, Rachel, Kansas. And as he's about to explain what, it, what is going on. And at this point, as a kid, I do remember being very confused with like, wait, so is... He and also because Mr. Kelsey is a, a a balding man, as is Mr. Simmons. Like I was kind of getting them confused in my young child brain of like, mm. who, so is he old man Simmons or like what is happening here? They explain it later in a very literal explanation scene where everybody just stands around and listens to the movie being explained. Um, boy, I miss those days. <laughs> but before that happens, we hear Alma scream and we see they rush out to follow the sound of the scream only to find her being held hostage by Nick Simmons wearing these mean black murder gloves. And he has captured her 
in the secret passageway and is going to kill her. He's threatening to kill her. Why? I think because she discovered him hiding in the secret passageway, perhaps. Oh, okay. Because Nick Simmons was going to kill Mr. Kelsey. <clears throat> is that the, My was guess. that the, oh, Not, okay. Alma was just like in there, but that. Mr. Kelsey was the only other person who knew what actually happened that night. Right. And so Nick Simmons had to kill him. He knows that. So, yes, he's going to. Okay, okay. So to wrap up, this this is the pivotal moment when it's finally the mystery is revealed to be the very scary man we've always thought to be the bad guy the entire time. Go figure. So uh, Luther sneaks around back to the living room. And he finally starts to, he gets to use his karate champion training and he tries to karate chop Nick Simmons on the back of the neck, but hurts his hand, which I thought was very funny because Nick Simmons is kind of a beefy dude. I could see that being a tough, a tough blow to, to your paw. It's like he didn't even notice it. Though. Yeah, he, did, he, he doesn't didn't react at all. He, there's no, yeah, no but sensation he, there. Well, fortunately for Luther, his whole body is a weapon, Catherine. So mm. he just ends up throwing himself mm. against Nick Simmons and knocking him over, releasing Alma. And uh, Mr. Kelsey is there with his gardening shears to keep him there. And they tie him up. And then they bring everybody back from town to explain the movie. And we everyone goes, oh, yes, sure. yes. So no, all, no evidence required. The mystery is Case revealed. <laughs> Mr. Kelsey, why did you wait 20 years to explain what actually happened? He's like, well, I was scared. And these were my shears. And all these people were dead and I was left alive. But it turns out that it was Nick Simmons hiding in the secret passageway the entire time who had killed both of them. And thus concludes the ghost and Mr. Chicken Happy Halloween, Catherine Sherlock. You are so welcome. I'm glad to have shared this with you. <laughs> Thank you. You've made it. It's so much. been a long night. You have listened to me do a lot of talking. Let me ask you a question. Yeah. This movie. Mm. We keep watching this thing. Mm. Absolutely not. Okay. <laughs> Any particular reason? Tiresome. You just, you don't just like I, it. I no, it did not hold my attention. Okay, it was everything I dislike about everything. Frankly, to, okay, let's dig into it. I mean, this is a love fest for me. I Really hate physical comedy. Okay, and I mean, I I just don't like. I it's child. You don't like the nervous childish. man routine. No, you don't no, no. Like it's it. just like no, no. I just yeah. don't like anything okay. about it. It is your childhood scary movie, and she's saying I don't like anything childish. So right there, you're absolutely at an opposing stance. Yeah, yeah. There's no way that we could ever find common ground. No, with no, this. No, 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 no. And if I did not I'm gonna, grow up with this, I guess, I could very well fall on the same side. You know. Mm. I'm gonna guess Shrishma would also say no if she were here. Yes, yeah, she. <laughs> <laughs> I would guess she would. This maybe would be a film she would not have finished. I I don't know. I don't know. We'll have to maybe maybe I'll show it to her and see if she thinks it's also a loud and obnoxious movie. <laughs> yeah, like she didn't show up maybe because she didn't watch it. Uh, it's she's been traveling for work, so right. So therefore, she probably didn't. Yeah, 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 yeah. Catherine, do you have any other demons you'd like to exercise regarding the ghost of Mr. Chicken at this point? I want to give you plenty of room here to really Mm. just lay out your argument for why this is trash, if you feel compelled to do so. Not really. I mean, it just, no. It's It's just a zero. I I don't don't want to waste any more (laughs) breath on it, frankly. (laughs) (laughs) Great. (laughs) Hey, sis. Yeah. Ghost of Mr. Chicken. Do we keep watching this thing? Hell yes! Yeah. <laughs> but I am so biased. I am biased because this is also probably like a book, you know, it's up there with like the Goonies, Clue, mm-hmm. um, you know, any number of uh, Back to the Futures or Indiana Jones or Jaws in my childhood of like, but I mean early childhood. Right. But just no. one one of those tapes that we had that you just well all we have are these tapes we'll just watch them Honestly, every day forever. I know our mother took great umbrage with our father showing you at a young age the Blues, Blues Brothers, Brothers because of the cursing. Like, yeah, that is totally inappropriate. I can see her saying yes to this because it was rather innocuous. I stand behind this movie as a good movie, <laughs> as a good haunted house we- movie. 
uh, a fun movie. An episode of Old Movie Time Machine where it's just Catherine and David. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sure. <laughs> Old David Time Machine. I'm just saying, I feel like they would agree on things. Okay. Okay. I mean, maybe we'll just have a little offshoot program, just the two of them. That'd be nice. <laughs> just the two you guys can just chat <laughs> chat on Sundays. <laughs> I mean, or you know chair conversation. Yeah, sure. Sure. <laughs> they would probably, the I'd listen to that. like that better because they both have great voices. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I'd be so curious. What are you guys talking like, about? What are, what? <laughs> the Alan Rickman tones in their ears for sure. Yeah. It would be like Catherine with her amazing voice and David with that deep <laughs> We understand you love your husband. This is not old David Time Machine. This is the ghost of Mr. Chicken, <laughs> goddammit. This is Halloween. Old David Yay. Time Machine. Love you, David. <laughs> but I think this is it's a I think this is a, a fair comedy from the 60s. Obviously, humor just in general does not age terribly well. It's very hard. It's a very few pictures from previous generations that work on subsequent generations it's just comedy mm. so this is obviously of an older school you know it's for kids though show it to your kids mm. and see what they, they will like it because he's a cartoon character don nuts and also if i'm watching a movie from 1966 in 1985 and it's just uh to this day a really important movie then clearly the timing doesn't matter you know like the era it makes no difference like there's something slapsticky and cartoony about this that will work with a certain age group perhaps i mean i'm keeping it as as uh as you should this concludes our discussion of the ghost of mr chicken thank you guys for indulging me i realize this was a very <laughs> selfish choice but speaking of selfish choices Let's talk about next week, because next week is a very special episode, and it is Carolyn's choice. So, sis, to, to remind everybody, we did this with Catherine and Excalibur. I make the gang watch a lot of these old, stupid movies, as is the Ghost of Mr. Chicken. And you're all very kind, and you indulge me this as we do our analysis, our anthropological study of the people in place uh, of these films. And now it's just a, a free session, a free class. You know, it's study hall. You can kind of do what you want with it. So, Carolyn, I'm taking off the rules and regulations. It can be a color movie. It can be black and white. It could be 3D, 4D, 5D, 2D, 1D, whatever. It can be from 1912. God, I hope not. It can be from uh, last week. It can come from any genre. It could be a fantasy. It could be a sword and sandal type of thing. It could be uh, ancient Egypt and Cleopatra. But, you know, the sky's the limit. Whatever movie you want to do, uh, it's it's your choice, Carolyn. So please tell us, what are we going to be talking about next Wednesday on Old Movie Time Machine? This is a really tough choice. I have a lot of movies I love. I have a lot of movies I could torture you with. But I'm going to go with Ghostbusters, the original. Okay, Ghostbusters, 84 edition, everybody. Bill Murray, Harold Ramis, Danny Aykroyd, Sigourney Weaver. Talk about sexual awakenings, you guys. Mm -hmm. I mean, Sigourney. Wow, Sigourney. So we will see you next time on Old Movie Time Machine when we're talking Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters. All right, over to you in the future. And so concludes yet another episode of Old Movie Time Machine, our Halloween episode, and also the conclusion of Hitchcocktober as we head into November here. Let us know what you thought. Please write into us, party line at oldmovietimemachine.com. We would love to hear from you. Also, if you enjoyed this program, please understand that there is more than double the content available for you to listen to. All you have to do is join us on our Patreon page, The Boom Room. The link is in the show notes. You just follow that guy and it'll take you right to The Boom Room, where for $2 a month, you can get more than double the content on the free feed. That's right. All these episodes, we go through beat by beat every scene of these movies and we dig into it people you do not want to miss it so please check us out there as for next week you heard it we're talking ghostbusters i'm not even going to tell you where to find ghostbusters it's all over the goddamn place and also kind of you should have seen ghostbusters by now it's been out since 1984 so please give that another look see before we start talking about it next wednesday and until that time please be aware if you weren't already this has been Old Movie Time Machine. <laughs> <laughs>